Once again, welcome to Buffalo Mountain Co-op's annual meeting. Um, it's been an incredible year. The glitch with the microphone only exemplifies what kind of year we've had. <laughs> um, and in the end, it all works out. Also exemplified by the microphone. Um, it's lovely to see everybody here. And I just want to say, as um, the president of the board, um, the power of a cooperative, a member-owned cooperative business has been just beautiful this past year, and especially moving day. I can't even express the amazingness of packing up the old store in one day and having 70% of it put on the shelves that same day yeah. <laughs> was beautiful. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I also really want to give a shout out to our GM, Emily. Um, I, uh, so her leadership has been awesome and um, keeping us all from being so scattered and, oh my God, I don't know what to do, we're overwhelmed. <laughs> and also Chris Duff, who was our project manager, who innocently one day, uh, When we conceived that they, well, well, when we heard that the market was uh, for sale, um, he innocently one day in February said, yeah, I'm just about done with my job at the ski slopes, now I have to find a new job. And as soon as he walked out the door, I ran up to Emily's office and said, Emily, <laughs> hire Chris. <laughs> He's available to be a project minister. I get, he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> um, it's, it's been amazing. And, um, and Bruce for keeping, helping us with all the finances stuff, and Katrina for helping us get some amazing grants. Um, and uh, I don't know who else is here that I can, I just, I just over and over again, I, I just am amazed with everybody's uh, help and encouragement to do this from the original vote, which actually was just about exactly to the day a year ago. It was only September 19th that we had our first informational meeting. And this summer when we were in the process of moving into the building, I kept looking back over old board meeting minutes and it was just like, holy smoke, we hadn't even got started yet. And uh, to see where we are now is just mind boggling. And to have, to be working in the store and having Every single day that I work there, someone comes up to me and says, this is amazing. Thank you for doing this for our community. And it doesn't matter what part of the food buying spectrum they are operating on, they love it. It's just been beautiful um, to have so much positive feedback. Seriously, every day that I work there. Emily told me the other day that some days when she's downstairs and dealing with the chaos that's behind the scenes that you all can't see, she's just, when I need a little up, I just go upstairs and someone says something really positive and it's all okay. <laughs> right? She's nodding her head. Yeah. Okay. Enough blabbing. Uh, I guess uh, enough, and, and thank you, and thank you. And um, the next thing on the agenda is um, our GM report. And so I'm gonna let Emily take over the microphone. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we need just a moment to get this working. Just said, I wanted to start with a whole bunch of thank yous because it's amazing how far we've come. Um, and everything that has happened. And I want to make a huge shout out to all the donors and investors that helped us financially with this move. Yes, thank you everyone. Soon we will have a poster up thanking individuals who have consented to let their name be shared. And once we get all those names together, there will be a poster up thanking everyone in the store. I also want to give a big thank you to all the trades folks that helped us in the store. Chris as project manager, and then the carpenters, the plumbers, the electricians, the refrigeration experts, the flooring folks, as well as designers that helped us design the interior of the store and some of the signage. Um, 
And a gigantic thank you to the employees. I was just at a co-op gathering last week where different co-op leaders, yay, oh hey. Here, just let it Oh, so yes. So I was at this co-op gathering last week from co-op leaders from around the state, and I was talking to you know the general manager of Hunger Mountain and just saying how exhausted everybody is in the grocery industry. I mean, we made it through COVID, which was so much work and so much effort, and they were seeing burnout right as we were moving. So not only did a lot of the crew at the co-op make it through the chaos and the, all the extra energy and concern of COVID, but then we moved. And so I'm really impressed with all the energy and effort and work that everybody has put in to our co-op. Yes. Um, and thank you for technical support. Great. So there's a thank you. I also want to give a big thank you. Oh, yeah, and also to the staff, thank you for those who are with us, those who um, have left. We really appreciate everybody's effort and support, and also to the new folks that have yet to join us, because we always need new folks. Um, and a big thank you to the board. Our board is a volunteer group of people who there's always you know effort to be on the board and the meetings and in between but this past year and a half almost two years really of doing feasibility studies market research all of that and then um, community meetings about a year ago and then just the logistics of the move just thank you all for all the time and energy that you put into this And generally at an annual meeting, you spend your time looking at the previous year and how that went. But considering everything we have going on, we're going to be focusing on somewhat of the previous year as well as some of the things about that are happening right now. I know that when Bruce gives his report about the Treasury's report, we'll talk a little bit more about last year. So one thing I wanted to talk about, I say a big thank you to the donors and investors, but I thought I would show you the amount of money that we raised. And um, down here is $167,000 in donations. Thank you all. And then 521,500 in loans from um, good folks like you, so thank you all. And then we got $281,800 in grants. Pretty incredible, right? Yeah. Um, and I want to give a big shout out to Katrina on our board who has a background in fundraising and grant writing. And she helped us as well as NCIC helped us get these grants because it's a lot of work that goes into them. Um, and then I want to share a little bit about what those grants were and how they fit into the food landscape or energy efficiency, whatever it is. Um, and one of the grants was WLEF for Working Lands Enterprise Fund was $130,500. Um, and that is a state administered grant that's looking at working lands, looking at infrastructure that helps working lands. Um, and it was a little unusual for a co op to receive money from this grant. Luckily for us, there was somebody on this grant administration committee that, under, that has a background in co-ops and was thinking like, if we want to help local foods, helping co-ops create access to local foods is a really great way to spend that money. So we're really excited that they decided to work with us and we're really hoping that our success will help them be more willing to give money to co-ops in the future. Um, and there's also some other great businesses, which is kind of cool about the grants, is who else got the money? Um, and there's Global Village Foods is one of the organizations, and we sell some of their ready-to-eat frozen food, and they are based in Vermont. Um, and it's really great, delicious food, and I'm excited um, that they got one to help them sell more of it as well as Center for Ag Economy and Jasper Hill. There was another grant related to this, it was slightly different, that Snug Valley Farm, Hillside Homestead, Sweet Rowan Farm, and Bear Roots Farm also got a grant. So we're in great company with that grant. The next grant, the HFFI grant, is a federally, like more um, throughout the country administered, and that was pretty competitive. We weren't sure if we were gonna get it. We're really grateful we did. And in that grant, co-ops across the country got money um, for that grant. 
And this grant, the way it's administered, it's going to go mostly towards our roof when we repair it next year. And yes, it wouldn't have to cost that much, but we really would like to increase the energy efficiency of the building and spend a little bit money replacing the roof so we can increase the energy efficiency. Um, we also got an energy efficiency grant, obviously going to go to efficiency. Some of the things we're starting with the foundation of uh, like getting controllers that help us have a little more precision in all of our refrigeration units, as well as notifying us when something is wrong. Because some of the equipment's old and it's really great to have as much heads up when they're not doing well. Um, and then we got a small $5,000 grant from CNPP, Community Navigator Pilot Program, Vermont Economic Development. And that was to have designers design the colors and the interior, as well as a lot of the signage you see in the store, which is something I like knew we needed help with, but it was really great to get this grant that was made it easy to spend money on design, because that's not always something that seems immediate. All right, so the next set of um, metrics. So when we think about metrics, if we look at numbers, like if I sent you a whole budget and we talked about it, I mean, that's Bruce's job. But if we had a big budget, <laughs> we would um, kind of get lost in the numbers. So it's good to think about what is our values? What are, what are the, some of the things that are is important to the co-op and how do we talk about them? Also, with the move, we've had a little over three months. That's not a ton of time to have really solid like financial data, but we do have some information to share with you. So obviously, I just mentioned the grants and local products. So one of the goals is to sell more local products. And so we have. We have 61 new products that we've taken on, brought on since the end of June, and 11 new vendors that sell local products. The reason we made that specification is like there are some people we purchase things from now that we now have more items that we get from them. And then we also have new producers that we haven't sold from before. Another metric you can look at is we can have this budget and we can have all these goals, but one is like we had these this financial feasibility study done and there were some pretty well educated guests and a lot of time and effort um, from Jacqueline, myself, and CDI, the Cooperative Development Institute who helped us with our feasibility study. And in it, it had some targets of how much do you think we're going to do in sales based on what the market did, based on what we did, and some other pieces of information. So we set this target. And instead of like saying the end year what we want to make, it's easier to break it down by day. Um, and that's what, on the right, that column is our target. And then our actual for the first three months, if you take the amount of income we brought in and divide it by day, you get that. And it's only $137 difference which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and I have to, uh, one thing that we knew it would be tricky to move in the middle of July or June, end of June, right before um, 4th of July, but it has been a challenge, a good challenge, to be as busy as we have been and constantly trying to make improvements and figure out systems and figure out how to do things and how to move things. And the team has done a great job working with that, and it does get better and better every day. So another metric that's important to us is how many members do we have, and are we including more members from our community? And so this year, since um, June through June through September again, we had 291 new members join. Yes. For the same time last year, we had 80 new members join. So that's amazing that people are joining and becoming members of the co-op. So yes, there's a lot of work to do. And yes, we will um, dive into the numbers more. But it can give you a good picture of some real successes we've had as a team at the co-op. Um, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to pass it on to, well, to Bruce. Thanks. <laughs> Well, I, I, 
Hello. As stated, um, I don't really have much to tell you this evening because I don't have any fancy numbers, but I do have copies of 2021 and 2020 um, sales reports. They're really outdated because what we have as a business today is so different than the business we had in 2020 and in 2021. Um, we did have a, success, a, a substantial increase in 21 as compared to 20. 20 was the year that COVID first hit us. It was probably the co-op's worst year. We lost a lot of money that year as a, as a store. And the following year, in 21, we had a much better year. And it provided us with a big cushion to go into the move with. And I think um, our sales went to about $2.5 million in 22. But we're like looking more like a four and a half to $5 million store now that we're getting into this new store. So numbers as far as sales and products is really, it's, it's really, we're looking at two different stores, you know, what we did in the past and what we're doing now. But um, I just wanted to share with you how important it was coming out of COVID times that the, um, the PPP money, the money that we got from the federal government, $102,000, really what changes the bottom line. If anyone picks up a P&L from 21 and 20, you'll see that we made a lot of money in 21 only because we had a big you know, infusion of cash from the federal government, which was then given, uh, it was given as a uh, forgiveness loan, you know, into a grant. And so that $100,000 on our taxes just gets to get back into our coffers. And it was the seed money that made the move basically possible. So even coming off of a really poor year in 20, and the store was really, you know, really hard pressed to operate during COVID um, in the space that we had there. You know, 21 really gave us a financial boost in order to move in, now in 22. You know, we're hitting our goals for this year. All of our, you know, metrics, if that's what you want to call them, as far as what we're spending on labor, what we're spending on cost of goods sold, is still totally within the same realm that it was in the other store. You know, we're seeing some higher costs in this new store, all the things that we knew we'd have. Um, but it's way too early in the season to say what 2022 is going to be financially. If there any questions about what we did in 20 or 21, I'd be happy to answer them. There's copies of P&L up here. The balance sheet compared to, normally at, the, at annual meetings would give you the last year's balance sheet. The balance sheet for the close of 21 is so different now in the middle of 22 with about a million point three dollars worth of assets put into ownership by the co-op. And the debt ratio is so different because so much of our money came in grants and loans, something that we never had on our balance sheet before. So, you know, next year when we have an annual meeting, we'll look at 2022's balance sheet. The numbers will be like a whole different set of numbers than we've ever seen before. Yes, yeah, Sean. Um, when you think we might have yeah, we could also consider, and we always have annual meetings in the spring. So numbers are usually done when tax time comes around, because without doing depreciation, without doing inventory, which gets done the first of the year, the numbers are not complete. And so normally what we've always in the 35 years before has always done our annual meeting in the end of spring. So we have complete numbers from the previous year and we talk about budgets for that, that coming year. But when COVID came around, we kicked the annual meeting out in March of 2020 and then we kicked it down the road to not even have one. So in 21, when we finally had one, we had it last fall because we needed it as a kickstart to the whole move project. So yes, we could have probably balance sheets and P&Ls to the members in, in April or May of next year when we close out this year's books. But I think a bigger discussion would be if the membership wants to move back to an annual meeting in the springtime or not, is something for the membership to talk to the board of directors about and to give feedback about. So that you can then have an annual meeting that then includes last year's numbers with some ability to discuss a budget and the projections for the coming year. Anything else? Well, I guess I just want to say thank you to Lydia, uh, who did not get mentioned, for running and helping us, Lydia, 
amendments with the capital campaign. Because the only way we were going to make this store move out of the space that we were in was with literally a million dollars worth of money that came from the outside world, you know, and the inside world, not community, you know, but they come from banks. You know, we got approved. We spent so much time last year jumping through hoops to get approved for the entire loan package from banks. And literally the last moment when I went to close, I'm the one that, you know, did the closing to buy the store. Literally the last moment is when we knew how much we raised and we're able to say no to a whole Vita loan, you know, cut the Mascoma bank loan in half. You know, we just borrowed so little money to make this happen. So thank you for everyone who really put up a lot in the community. So with your experience with the numbers, you know, you just told us a lot of interesting stuff and you jumped it down for us a little. But how what does that represent to you in your heart? How do you feel? Like how how are we set going in? Okay, so I was so scared of the nut, the amount of mortgage we were going to carry in the new store once we moved for the first few years. Because all these projections that we've done with CDI and everyone else is based on this like three or five year thing. But by borrowing so much money and only paying like a half to a 1% interest for the next five to seven years before we start paying back even the first part of money to our members, it just changes our, our monthly is like in half, less than half. And so, and cash flow being that as good as what we thought they'd be, but yet, our monthly, you know, not, you know, that we have to pay for mortgage is nowhere near what the current cost we thought was going to be. So it's a lot more optimistic to me, you know, as far as the numbers go and making this thing happen. So the next thing we're going to talk about is Chris. Yes. Mascoma, Mascoma Bank, which is a, um, a credit union. Credit. Yeah, they call it a Mascoma Bank, though, right? Yeah. Credit union. Yeah. A mutual bank, but it's. And it's um, both that we're doing on the state bank, how is that different from a Vermont state bank? Well, I think Vermont state bank has not come up yet to happen, and maybe we can move into that. And I think that Jacqueline has that on the agenda to talk about. But we're not going to do that next. What we're going to do, Chris? Going to give us um, our expansion report. Then we're going to go into a state bank discussion. And is that half percent interest locked in, or they sell? Well, the Muscoma loan? Yeah. It's it's a it's a balloon loan, so it's like five years right now. And so yes, you know, so in five in twenty twenty seven, we'll be renegotiating. But the amount of money that we borrowed, you know, at the time of closing, 430000 as compared to the 800000 900000 we thought we were going to borrow, is so little. That I wouldn't be surprised if this community comes out between now and then we buy out that loan. You know, it's not, it's not a big loan any longer. What's that? You know, I said the economy has collapsed. I mean, the larger. It has. It sure has. And who knows when it's going to go in five more years, right? I'm just glad that we don't owe a lot of money to somebody else during these five years. That we understand. Yes, but in five, five years. That's right. Thank you. Here's Christopher. Um, so. I, they call it the expansion report, and this is more of a personal, uh, project manager report that I have for you. And I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to read it. Um, it's this thing that I wrote. Um, all right. So the idea of moving to a new location started about 10 years ago when the board has, uh, first looked at a long-term vision for the store. At that time, the Hardwick Village Market approached us with the opportunity to purchase their store. As a board, we weren't prepared, uh, but we saw the market as a pretty rare opportunity to solve a lot of the issues that we had in the store in the current, in the old Buffalo Mountain Co-op location. We weren't able to make it work at that time. After a lot of research and reflection on the board, the chance to buy the market came up again about two and a half years ago. We dug in, and with overwhelming support from our member owners, all of you, uh, we were able to figure out the logistics and the monies to make it work. A year and a half ago, Emily and the board asked me to help 
shepherd this process. Uh, it's been a very rewarding and positive experience for me, and I honestly hope it accomplishes the goals of uniting a community and continues to offer healthy foods to everyone while supporting the local economy. <laughs> we, we own this store. Your local investments were what made this possible. The money we generate largely stays here in this community. Along those lines, when we started this project, our goal was to use as many contractors <clears throat> and people within our co-op community as much as possible to renovate and build out the new store. When we got the results of the building inspection completed last year, you would have thought this place was gonna fall down. Honestly, <laughs> there were lots of issues and serious deferred maintenance as Joe B. McDonald, our inspector put it. Um, it was for all of us on the board and with Emily, it was a bit of where do we start? There was just so many things. There was financing, permitting, design, locating contractors, planning the move, rallying volunteers, managing monies, ordering equipment, merging staff, all while operating two stores, which largely fell on Emily's shoulders. <laughs> um, thank you. I, yeah, there should be a little round of applause. <laughs> So I'm not going to go into all the details of the process, but on a financial basis, we stayed, and largely because of Bruce's report of, and, and the, the fundraising we did, we stayed well within our budget um, to date. There are still a few projects coming, but we still have some grant money available for that. So some most of that should be defrayed still. Um, and the cost to date for just the build out, not including the purchase of the building, but does include most of the organizational, re, you know, um, uh, work that was done, the contracting, the permitting was about four hundred and sixty seven thousand um, dollars. When we were planning the move, we broke up the project in, into three phases, the first being the initial build out and renovations. Um, in, um, and repairs, purchasing equipment and moving the store. The second phase were projects that really didn't affect the opening of the new store, um, such as the parking lot, the roof, um, a possible build out in the front of a vestibule. Um, and the third phase is more long range thinking, which Emily touched on a little bit about making the building more efficient. Um, so we completed We've successfully completed what we called phase one. The store is open, running, and running fairly smoothly in terms of the mechanics and logistics of the store. You know, there's still work to be done on other things. Um, <laughs> so in six short months, since March 15th, I want to give you a list of some of the bigger projects that we did. Um, we combined and moved Mary's existing Hardwick Village Market Bakery with the co-op's wonderful kitchen into the back of the store into what was an unused wasted space. And it's beautiful back there. We added a hood with a fire suppression system, a new oven, dishwasher, and windows. This included a big project of moving an entire electrical subpanel down into the basement. We added an ADA compliant bathroom on the first floor. This also included moving an electrical sub panel, another big project. We added a third register and a customer service desk. We moved the existing registers to create more efficiency, efficiency in space. We essentially bought more real estate in the basement by adding a second fire egress on the east side of the building. This stairwell also serves the staff for easier stocking of certain products. The fire marshal was not going to allow us to use that end of the basement at all. No people were supposed to go into that section of the building without a fire escape. The options were either a fire, extinguish fire extinguishing suppression system or an egress. So for about 
I don't even know the percentage, but it was pretty prohibitive to put in the um, fire suppression system. So for a pretty reasonable amount of money, we gained about 3,000 square feet of real estate in the building. Um, we, did, we redid the floors with the help of Chuck's flooring, and they're beautiful. I don't know, I'm sure you've all been in there and scratching your feet around, but it's just so nice. Um, <clears throat> with the help of Associated Grocers, we redesigned the store layout and added additional shelving. For more products, we're able to carry a lot more. We purchased and installed a used but new produce cooler with more space and better lighting for our amazing local produce. We added a new produce processing room in the basement with sinks and office, and office space next to the uh, walk-in produce cooler. We cleaned, improved, we cleaned, improved lighting, and reorganized the basement for additional space and shelving for back stock and staff. We added a bulk processing area in the basement. We added well-lit and spacious offices in the basement in the former unusable area. We added a coffee and snack bar with a filtered water filling station and a kombucha filling station. These, I, I'm going on and on, but I'm gonna give, it to, give you it all. <clears throat> we added a seating area with windows, charging stations, and a, and a counter to enjoy the grab and go offerings at the store. We installed a new meat grinder for Rusty and, the, and his crew. We rebuilt the existing fire egress stairs, leaving the kitchen. We painted the entire retail space in new construction with new color schemes. We installed new signs with lighting on the building and on the street. We corrected and repaired much of the deferred maintenance in the building, including identifying and correcting lots of questionable electrical issues. We added two marked handicapped parking spaces near the entrance to the store. Yay. Um, pic picnic tables outside, washing the front of the building, moving endless piles of shelving, moving items around and then moving them again and then moving them again. Um, inspections by the fire marshals, health department, and, and it goes on and on. And I'm not going to get into all the little details, but these are the projects that we did in the last six months to make that store work. I do want to talk about the amount of local contractor support we had. And um, I do, I hope I'm not gonna bore you too much, but I wanna highlight these people. So I'm gonna mention them. Um, Aaron Sally did the electrical work with the help of Scott Ackerman, both from Cabot. Andy Hatch and Robert Baird of RAD Builders provided the bulk of the carpentry work from Wolcott and Morrisville. Josh Holmes did all the plumbing with the help of Clay Lasher and Sebastian P uh, Bowers, all from Hardwick. I don't think Josh is here, but I think we both learned a lot on this project. <laughs> Cindy Campreth with her amazing painting from Hardwick. Jonah Bourne with his carpentry skills and artistic welding uh, skills from Cabot. Larry Hubner with his last minute drywall work, Walden. Chuck and Chris Guest from Chuck's Flooring and Burke, awesome people to work with. Um, New England Vent Tech from Derby. Patrick Ducharme and, and Caleb Millington for site work, Hardwick and Walden. Sam Majors and Nick Hoffmeyer Meister from Turner Piping for hooking up the produce cooler from Rutland and Barton. Um, nope, I lost my spot. Ray Chase for helping with refrigeration from Craftsbury. Robin Towns from All Metals Recycling, who was a big help to us from Hardwick. Kevin, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, from Portland Glass in Barry. You know, all these people are from right around here. Dave Myers, Dave Sauter, Tracy Dumphy of Dave Couch Signs in Stowe, Pullen Lumber, and their super helpful staff right here in Hardwick. Vermont Fire Extinguisher in Barry. Jay Barrett from Greensboro for his endless insight and design work with us on, on redoing the building. Mark Bromley is now doing design work for us from Cabot. These are all people right here in our community and I love it. John Hogan for his drywall work. He's from Marshfield. Frank Sauer for absolutely everything from Hardwick. <laughs> Mayo Crane from Hardwick. 
uh, Michael Renault for his bucket truck, using his bucket truck from Craftsbury. Um, Bill Chinsing for just about absolutely everything from Hardwick. Um, Lionel Morrison from right here in Hardwick for his IT work. Um, Joby McDonald from Albany. Jen Baker and Ann from right here in the area helping us do the move. Um, Ethan Bellavance uh, from Efficiency Vermont right here in Hardwick. Don Marsh from Barry for uh, doing our wastewater engineer work. Um, Lisa Gannett from Sunwise Surveying in Cabot. So it's just amazing the skills and the uh, and what we have here for a community. Um, and the drags, <laughs> yeah. Um, I also need to, you know, I'm, this is kind of a big thank you tonight, but uh, I need to thank the people who do the permitting and the work, you know, um, and inspections and such, because every one of them were super helpful to us. Um, I definitely want to mention Kristen Leahy right here in town and how great she was, supportive, answering lots of questions, helping me in areas I had no clue what to do. Um, Dave Upsom, likewise, the Hardwick Electric Department, Hardwick Hi Highway Department, they all stepped up at different times. Um, and, you know, all of the, not all of these people, but some of the fire marshals can, can be kind of intimidating and authoritative, but all of them were so helpful to me and they were really tolerant. And when something wasn't quite right, they gave me opportunities to work around it or get through it. Um, and that would be Sean Goodell, the state fire marshal, John Hammer, the plumbing inspector, John Black, the electrical inspector, and Robert Bruce, the uh, uh, health, health inspector for the state. Um, so I also, I can't even begin to go through the list of all the volunteers who stepped up at the very last minute when I had no idea how we were gonna move that cooler or empty that room. And it, it was just like people appeared, sometimes off the street. Like sometimes I would tap on someone's shoulder and said, hey, have you got an hour? And they would help me. And it, it, was, it was just amazing. And, you know, similar to Emily, I have to thank our amazing combined staff now, our new staff, because all along the way, the, uh, the original Hardwick Village Market staff were answering all the questions, you know, like, oh, where do you keep this? What do you do with this? You know, and they, they had all the answers. They're wonderful people. I'm so glad to have gotten to know them. Um, I'm wondering if the staff was here in the room, because I know it's not everybody, but if they were here, could you stand up, please? Dad? Yeah, please. I would love to see you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. It was good. It's good to notice these people because I absolutely could not have done this without them, you know, every step of the way. All right, so enough on the thank yous for now. Um, phase, so that was phase one. It was awesome. We got it done. We plowed through it. Everybody worked really hard and it came out really well. Um, phase two um, involves some of these grants that Emily was talking about. Um, there are projects that didn't don't really affect the operate day-to-day -day operations of the store, like I said. So we're gonna try to do the roof. We've been working with Efficiency Vermont. Oh, <laughs> Mike. Um, all right. Uh, so I have stepped down from the project manager role here and I've handed that baton to Bill Chidsey and I don't know if you've met Bill yet. Bill has a huge and very uh, uh, deep skill set for the next step we're taking in this um, in the development of the store and that includes a lot of efficiency steps for the building. Um, and so phase two, which is where Bill's moving in here, 
includes things like the roof. And we've been working with Efficiency Vermont because, we're, you know, a lot of heat is lost through our roof. You see a lot of staining on those ceiling tiles. That's all ice damming that happens in the winter. We're hope, hoping to eliminate all of that um, with a new roof. But it's going to be very expensive. Um, that A lot of that will come from the grant. Um, other steps in the... I don't know if I'm speaking into this thing or not. In uh, phase two uh, would be a vestibule in the front of the building, create somewhat of an airlock in the winter. We'll put automatic doors on it. It will increase our retail space by moving the carts outside into that space, allowing us more retail space inside, but also some maybe seasonal retail space on the outside too, um, or out in the vestibule. So we see that as a big positive. Um, parking lot, you know, we need to do something about it. The entrance, exit, parking, it's mayhem right now. So, um, you know, paving it, uh, d uh, really uh, designated an entrance, designating an entrance and an exit to the parking lot and, um, and striping it would all probably help, you know, some of the issues that are currently existing. Um, we still want to develop a community green space in the lot next door, in the lawn area next door, maybe a gathering space where we can actually have events there. Um, and we, you know, uh, want to uh, repair and or replace the ceiling, ceiling tiles and lighting in the retail space. So those all come in the next step. Um, so... Emily already mentioned the grants that were available. I was going to. I don't need to redo that. Um, Bill will be overseeing this. And then phase three is an interesting um, phase. It's uh, probably the most expensive phase, uh, in a sense. Um, but that's, uh, Bill really believes, he's an envelope building specialist, and really is, he and Efficiency Vermont really believe that we can get this building near net zero. And there are ways to do that. They're expensive, particularly, uh, you know, we have this scattered refrigeration system right now with a, co a condenser and a compressor for each unit that we have in the building. Um, and they have more efficient systems where it's a single rack system that provides needs to each refrigeration system as it, need, as it calls for it. Um, it means pulling all those units into one big, not big unit, much smaller than what we have. And uh, it's way more efficient. But with that system, we could start recapturing heat. We could start recycling heat in the building. Um, our electric bills will go down. We could probably eliminate our heating bills altogether. Um, in fact, Bill suggests we get rid of the furnace in a few years when we do that. Um, so that's phase three. Um, it's going to require a bit of investment to do, um, but I think the return for all of us would be pretty good in the long run um, in terms of the health of our planet and our community. Um, so thank you. Um, this has been, a, this has been an incredibly rewarding experience and I can only hope that the seeds that we're sowing today create deep sustainable roots for this community and make us resilient to the fu future issues. Thank you again, Chris, for managing that whole project. It was incredible. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I'm Jacqueline Rieke. Hello, I'm on the board. I'm in the middle of a two-year term. Um, and you may know me better from 18 years of selling a local, pro local products to the co-op as Nutty Steph. Um, and I'm really um, pleased to meet this new vendor, Bridget, from Root to Vitality, who um, just reminds me she's two years into her journey, and I'm always so proud of local 
um, food and medicine creators in our community. Um, it's not an easy road and she's doing what looks like an incredibly beautiful job. I'm just getting acquainted with her company today, but I hope you'll stop and see her. And perhaps when we're in our small groups, maybe she'll want to like bring samples around to put in front of us so we can like CBD out while we're talking to each other, which we're going to do soon because we really want to hear from you folks about what's on your mind. So after just a few more talky things up here, talking heads, we're going to um, break you up to please talk with each each other and then meet back up and hear from you about what's on your mind. So that's effectively um, the meat of the agenda and that's coming right up. First, um, we're going to talk a little bit about public banking. Why public banking? As a co-op, it's um, part of our mission to encourage other cooperative um, ways of resource sharing in our community. And also, according to our particular co-op ends, we aim to use some of our time and resources and togetherness to do some educating. So this seemed like a good thing this year to bring to the body of membership about something going on in the state that we can support just by using our voice. And so. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly what a public bank is, and then we're going to watch a brief video about what a public bank is, and we're going to also have, I'm going to put uh, links to a bunch of more information about public banks somewhere on the website so that if you're voting on the ballot, because um, we're voting whether to endorse or not endorse that move in the State House of Vermont as a co-op, um, then you can research it more and vote yes or no on that on the ballot, please. The ballots that you have today, if you haven't filled it out yet, has this vote on the front and the four board members that are running on the back. You're supposed to vote for four board members out of four candidates. And I'm going to announce them right after this also. Did you get the movie hooked up? Okay. Um, Public Banking Institute. Thank you. Um, so a public bank differs from other kinds of banks because it isn't a citizen deposit bank. So it's not where you would go to do your banking. Okay. So who banks there? It's basically one bank account in our public bank, which is the state of Vermont. So the state of Vermont moves $8 billion through itself every year. We collect taxes and fees and then we spend them. But in the meantime, we put them in the bank, right? The state of Vermont as it's collecting its money. And currently we have that bank account that moves $8 billion a year in M&T Bank, the 11th biggest bank in the country, which if any of you were um, members of, what was the one that just got eaten by M&T Bank and they did a terrible job transitioning? And you know, angry faces. Okay. Um, anyway, they are a very destructive bank um, invested in Wall Street, which invariably perpetuates the military machine. And um, we can keep that money in our own state every year by putting it in our own bank account and turn that into our own rotating lending fund that can also earn money um, on its way into our own bank account and on its way out of our own bank account instead of sending money to Wall Street and then borrowing money from Wall Street for our local programs. So this is the ultimate and highest power, um, in my opinion, way that as a co-op we could use our voice to perpetuate more um, pacifism and humane ways of resource distribution. We do a great job with our $4.4 million a year business here of moving local resources um, in ways that are peaceful instead of militaristic. But this is a way we can impact a much on a much larger scale. So now we're going to watch this little movie. Um, quick note about public banks while they're getting this. Some people worry that it would compete with local credit unions and, and local banks. Um, and like I explained, it's not for citizen deposits, and so it doesn't compete. But um, on the other, uh, 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 to the contrary, our local banks and credit unions would be strengthened by having a Vermont State Bank because it will do what's called participation loans, where the state bank can capitalize and fund credit unions and local banks to be able to lend more money and to strengthen them. The one public bank in America, there's 32,000 public banks in the world. This is a very well-proven and effective um, type of organization. There's only one in America because the forces of Wall Street are very powerful at trying to prevent this from happening, which is the only reasonable way a municipality, in my opinion, would manage their money is if they keep it for themselves. But um, North Dakota has um, a state bank they've had for 100 years, and they have five times more local banks and credit unions than other states per capita. So the city have decided. Thank you. 
In this city, in anywhere USA, the residents of this city have decided they want a park. The city council agrees that the park is a great idea. But how will they pay for it? The city needs to borrow money. But borrowing money means the city has to pay a lot more money in interest and fees that could double the cost of the park. And that money leaves the city. It goes to Wall Street investors who really don't care about the park or the city at all. This is a bad deal for the city and its residents. There's a much better option. An option that's been proven around the world. A public bank. A public bank is a bank owned by the residents of a city, state, region, or territory. Private Wall Street banks just want to make profits for their shareholders. But public banks have a mission to serve the public good. They have to reflect the values and needs of the community. And that makes all the difference. Politicians don't run a public bank. Their job is to just set it up by listening to what the people need and want. Public banks are run by skilled local bankers who know their neighbors. Residents are on the supervising board to keep tabs on what the bank's doing. Public banks can save communities lots of money. First, they cut out expensive Wall Street fees, which can be hundreds of millions of dollars a year in a big city. Second, they can lower interest rates on the city's loans, which means there's more money to spend on other projects. Third, their profits go back to the city, not to Wall Street. So a public bank can make money for the city. All this means the people of the city have a lot more money to fund all the things they need, such as bridges, good roads, good schools, renewable energy, affordable housing, lower taxes, and the park the people wanted. They now control their own money and they can build their own future. Join the movement. To find out more, go to publicbankinginstitute.org. Thank you all for your attention to that, and I'd love to get into a big conversation, but we don't. In the interest of time, we're not going to talk anymore about that. The last thing I'll say about the public banking is that if we decide to support it as a co-op, the legislator who's putting a bill forward for the next biennium that we're going to be working on trying to pass to establish a bank told me a story about um, when he did the last attempt at putting a public banking bill out, which was five years ago, which was squashed by Wall Street. Um, he had a pretty big email list of people interested in public banks, and he's, he, they emailed him out and said, please ask your legislators to co-sponsor this bill. And the next Tuesday, when Brian Cena got in, he's the representative that's going to do the bill, he said there were 20 legislators lined up at his desk. How did you get 15 of my constituents to email me? I, I want to co-sponsor this bill. So 10 or 15 constituents contacting a legislator makes them want to take action. It's all it takes. And so with more people, we have a really big voice in the state house. And what we'll do is reach out to you if the co-op does decide to support this when the bill is at key moments. And we'll say, please call your legislator. And with three minutes time, we can make a big difference in moving such a bill forward. So, thank you. Um, now to introduce our new board. Yeah, let's hear it for a public bank. <laughs> Good. So um, we have two returning, uh, two incumbents that we hope return to the board. One is Chris Duff, and one is Bruce Kaufman. You've heard from both of them. I think they've proven their competency. Besides, I didn't prepare any elaborate words about them, but they're great. And the nice guys, but actually, I'm really effective and accountable, and nice to work with as well. So, um, and then we have Heather Winner. And we're looking up her um, bio right now, and I'm going to read it to you. You might know her from she was working at the co-op. Kelly Notterman we're going to do first. All right. Is Kelly here? OK. Um, well, here's her bio. I am a loyal Local shopper since 2001 of the Buffalo Mountain Co-op, Hall's Market turned the village market, and now the Buffalo Mountain Market. I value locally produced food and also deeply care about food access. Can we put her photo up? Um, okay. Uh, local grocery stores provide more than just food to a community. They build the community by offering sustenance, employment, a meeting place, while helping the local economy thrive by circulating more dollars within a community. Operating a store within walking distance of a village creates food access for community members with potential food insecurity. 
I currently work as the communications director at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund based in Montpelier. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to stay close at home, I work remotely from my home in Hardwick most of the time, so I regularly stop in for last-minute lunch items. For VSJF, I am responsible for marketing communications, public relations, and social media for VSJF programs, including Farm to Plate. The Farm to Plate Network is responsible for collectively implementing the 15 strategic goals of Vermont's 2021 to 2030 Food Systems Plan. I think my work at VSJF would make me a good fit for the board because I can offer the latest resources and support available from a statewide food system plan level. I hold a Bachelor of Arts degree in English with a concentration in journalism from University of New York at Buffalo. I started my writing career as a full-time reporter and photographer for the Hardwick Gazette in 2001. Prior to VSJV, I worked as the senior copywriter and senior social content strategist for eight years at Gilia, a global marketing communications agency. I've held various marketing, writing, and social media positions in New York and Vermont. I currently serve on the board of Four Seasons of Early Learning, a nonprofit early education organization offering nature-based preschool, infant, and toddler care in Greensboro Bend. For the Four Seasons board, I regularly share farm to school plate grant opportunities as I hear of them and support the executive director in offering exceptional programming to children from over 10 towns. Previously, I served on the board of the Northeast Kingdom Arts Council which manages the programming and preservation of the historic Hardwick townhouse. I grew up surrounded by farms in Western New York, and you may recognize my last name because my husband, Ben Notterman, and his parents, Nancy and Helm, run Snug Valley Farm in East Hardwick. The farm produces 100% grass-fed beef, pasture-raised non-GMO heritage pork, 100% grass-fed lamb, and five acres of pumpkins. I live in the village of Hardwick with Ben, our son Fritz, our dog Maggie, and our flock of chickens. Unfortunately, the chickens are not allowed to live in the house, though. That's Kelly Notterman, board candidate. Super sweet. Thank you. You're so on it. All right. Um, Heather Winner is the other new candidate, former buyer for beer, wine, and frozen selections. So frozen sections. Is Heather here? Thank you. Okay. Um, Heather Winner began her career in public service, managing volunteers and fundraising for public radio. She has more than 22 years of experience in nonprofit management, community health strategies, and organizational development. During her time working on campus and in the community, Heather created and delivered high impact educational content to a wide variety of stakeholders, provided project management and strategic guidance to executive leadership, and facilitated consensus building workshops. Heather also had the awesome opportunity to work as a buyer for the co-op during its transition phase from December 2021 to July 2022. Heather graduated from Colorado State's Master's in Student Affairs and Higher Education Program in 2008 with an emphasis on student health and wellness. She has certificates in professional development, coaching, and facilitated decision making. An active outdoors woman, gardener, and cook, Heather lives in Cabot and is a rural firefighter slash first responder. Uh, why do I want to join the board? I'd be honored to join the Buffalo Mountain Market Board. My interest in joining the board stems from the fact that I want to continue to support the important work of making the market a vibrant center for customers and staff to access to high quality products and important employment opportunities, all while creating a welcoming environment for everyone. I believe my seven months as a buyer in the wine and frozen food departments, as well as my deeper pre experience in community development and nonprofit management gives me a unique insight into how we can build a sustainable future for the market. Thank you, Heather Winner. Any questions about the board candidates or the voting or the ballots or anything? She's not. She couldn't make it today. And I'm looking for my outdoor box and my email, and I realized that this happened on the day that we closed on the sale. Oh. <laughs> and I didn't send it. It was actually still on my desk. So oh, no! So I wanted to put that out there. <laughs> oh, my goodness, your service yeah. would be much desired. I wonder what we should do. Do you propose, do you want to try to... Is it too late to, to apply, or do you... Yeah. We're just finding out about it. 
anybody who might be in a candidate would go face for that. That's that been done, and I know at least a couple of people have written in the candidates. The voting goes for two weeks from today, which is the first day. So several people have voted. Do you want to introduce yourself? And we'll put your name for these folks to people have put their um, their things in the ballot and um, Sharon brought up we could pull the ballots and start fresh. Okay, it's that impossible. I don't want to do a talk Yeah. There's four out of would be five. Four seats open and um, you would make five. Um, <laughs> this is really cheesy, but is it possible that um, Sort of including you this year in some committee work and other projects when we need help would be would be like a direction to go and then definitely running next year, which we really want you to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just I I I I'm not full checking that it went out. But Tell me your name again. Nora. 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 Yeah. Who? Which woman? From the flower basket? I want to hear the Nora. Nora is a proud owner of our former. Nora. Good to meet you. Hi. Thanks so much, Nora, for speaking up. I appreciate you bringing it up. I'm sorry that happened. Okay, so like I said, we want to hear from y'all. We're so glad you're here, and this is your co-op, and we are your board, and we, our job is to help steer and guide and develop the strategic direction of the co-op, um, but we really can't do that unless we know what you want. So we would love for you to please gather in groups of five um, and you know, just stand up and shuffle into groups. Again, stop and visit Route to Vitality if you want to get a little CBD. I'm guessing you have samples of some kind. Sample something on your way to your group. Um, and then talk. You're going to have 15 minutes together, 20 minutes together um, to please bring forward. We were going to come up with a specific thing. Tell us about this. But we want it to be open-ended. What's on your mind? What matters to you? And then we'll come back together. Please choose one person to report out from your group. That person should take notes. They'll have about one minute to share. Any questions? All right, let's group up into five and talk about the co-op. Thank you. In addition to the input we're going to get tonight, we want to hear from you ongoing. This is a pivotal time for our organization. We have a lot of power to craft this new, much larger business in the ways that serve our membership. We would like to talk with you more if you are interested and willing to bring us more of your ideas and um, dreams for how the, the co-op can be the best it can be. And so we would like to have you for dinner with us, the board. There's some sign-up sheets. It says dine with the board. And there's 24 slots. You can't sign up for all three dinners, one only. Thank you. Um, so please do sign up if you want to meet up with us and bring us more of your ideas. We need them. Um, and for tonight, we're going to hear if you can keep it to, you know, a couple of minutes each, then that would go really well. Please talk into the microphone, representatives. Thank you so much. And in addition to everyone hearing you here, we're going to be on the Hardwick television. So the better you can talk into the mic, the more we can bring your ideas to the town at large. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So I'll just go over the list we have here. Um, first, the point was curiosity about how things are going with the merger. Uh, how do the village market shoppers feel in general about the co-op having taken over the space and the, and the business? Is it more co-op shoppers that are buying things which weren't available before, which has increased sales, or is it an increase due to village market customer sales, adding on to the original co-op income? Uh, is this something where we're just listing stuff off and not really answering things now? Okay, so some frustration that some village market products have been eliminated from the new store. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an apparent or clear way to request new products or to request old products to come back. 
Um, some clarity on whether, what the process is for getting feedback over to the people who are making decisions on product would be appreciated. Um, is there a possibility of celery being lower in price, organic celery? Uh, because most of the summer it was about four to five dollars a bunch. Um, why are the organic and non-organic produce so far apart, or particularly the apples seem to be very, very far, far apart from each other? Um, could they be closer together? There is fresh bread in two different sections. Is it possible to improve signage to eliminate some confusion so people will know that they have other options for bread in a different section of the store? Um, better publicity regarding annual meetings and other events, or maybe more like increase the points of communication with members and other customers regarding events. Um, I guess a, a, few, a few people we didn't really see signage in the store until maybe closer to the day of today's meeting and wondered, and they didn't really see much on Facebook. I wondered if there were other ways also to communicate it in the future. Um, more detailed reports about what's going on regarding quantitative process, um, sorry, progress would be appreciated as far as just in the co-op, I guess, with sales and, and things like that. And we are looking forward to improvements in the parking lot. All right, that was a lot more detailed than our group, but uh, here goes. Um, first, we started out with what we liked best about the, uh, this way, that what we liked best about the new co-op. Parking, the fresh meat and organic uh, foods, and basically the, all the community connections, that was the high point. Alternative, alternative foods and bulk spices, bulk and spices. The space was greatly appreciated. You can walk down the aisle and talk to someone and p other people can get past you. Um, they, we enjoyed local food sources and the kitchen was a big plus. And the list that we had for what we'd change or like to see more of or something improved on. They would, we'd like to see a hot bar for a warm meal, daily soup offerings as a possibility, uh, ways to learn about what's going on. There's still, uh, it's still hard to make connections with what the co-op is doing with the members and, and, and getting that information out to the members. So outreach, um, possibly workshops, cooking classes, uh, co-op meetings at where and when do they happen? That information doesn't seem to kind of filter down to people that would like to attend. And uh, that was our list. Thanks to Beth Kate for taking these notes, which I can barely read. <laughs> Only because of my eyesight. Uh, oh, it's okay. Can you hear me? Um, we had a lot of different concerns and opinions about product mix. Um, there was mention um, that someone was looking for healthy chips and they couldn't find them. And there was a conversation with Annie, maybe, but she wanted more information about what are, what are the obstacles um, with maybe different buyers, different distributors, which are holding back having some of the products that we used to have, or and uh, I'll just I'll just read rather than paraphrasing. Um, we're missing some or many of the organic products that are not currently available on the shelves, and we're hoping for expansion of that rather than um, digression, I guess. Um, one person expressed is okay with the amount of conventional, um, but concerned with how it relates to our mission statement. Do we still stand behind our mission statement? Um, and has big concerns about Coke and Pepsi products and corporate chocolate, um, because he feels those, those, well, not he feels, they do have high levels of 
high fructose corn syrup and considers them not to really be a food or to be a healthy food and um, something that's contributing to uh, diabetes and health, poor health in a lot of children. And so it's something we should really think about whether we should carry that. And there was some counter discussion too about um, you know, what would that really look like financially and could we phase products like that out? Um, there was a sentiment we should have moved toward a more radical store that rejected all this crappy food that is currently on the shelves um, and feeling like that uh, opportunity was taken away when it was decided to take on the full inventory of the old store or of the market. Um, also some concern about the air quality in the basement and the conditions that the staff is working in, whether that's healthy and if there's any plans for improvements there. Um, again, just hoping for expansion of the organic and bulk products and haven't really seen that filling the shelves more so than the other products. And um, also appreciation for providing space for democracy in action and hoping that the radicals can each of each side can listen and hear, when they hear each other. We had a really um, diverse group in our little group and that we had a few member owner shoppers, plus we had some workers, plus a board member joining that, or two. So the very first thing, something that you brought up there at the end there was the, um, the staff concern, because that was the first thing that came up at our little discussion, um, specifically from a produce point of view. And I'm not talking to myself as a produce person who happens to be very involved in the produce, but it's from a worker's point of view, about the amount of volume that we're now doing in the basement and the work zone downstairs, about bringing that tonnage upstairs on a set of stairs and how hard that is and that she feels that we actually are losing workers and we're not being able to keep the staff that we have because we don't have the right um, infrastructure. And talk about reserving some space in the lot next door. Maybe when we have the next build out, we can look at bringing the produce and some of the heavier items from the basement onto the post floor so that our workers do not have to um, schlep them up the stairs. We actually, that was one of the, um, at the elevated dumb waiter was the solution idea. You know that got kicked out. Um, you know, you know, we came up with the problem and a few ideas, and one of the ideas there was the elevator. The next six items are all related to signage, so it's really interesting. It's what you know we just heard a moment ago. Um, the first one being unit pricing. We do not have unit pricing in the store, and without a, 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 um, a price on the item, then people who are shopping for the uh, best deal, as far as the most food nutrition for the amount of money spent, you know, they're not getting to see apples against apples. And with that labeling, just all the labeling that we don't have a really good um, differentiation between um, non-GMO, organic, and some of the more conventional things that have a dot sticker, a color-coded system would work in that because it's really hard to find what they're looking for. And that was the next three items that basically we came up with was things like the bakery being split. There's some bread here, there's some bread being there. You know, there's lots of things that are not organize and perhaps just a move to keep our signage a little bit to keep our product more together. And we heard from that same staff member earlier again who said like, perhaps there's not enough staff and so one of the solutions we came up with is perhaps in the working member program we need to bring back some working members to be into the store to help do some of the signage, to do some of these things. Because the staff does not have time at the end of their day to say, oh this used to be here, now here's a sign saying that we moved it over to aisle four. Perhaps we need to get you know, an hour every single day of some members. And also the staff is so overworked with what they're doing and the volume that they're doing, they can't take the time to answer questions, perhaps, from all of our member owners to where things are going. So maybe you know, those key hours in the afternoon to have a member, um, worker member owner in the store getting member hours, working hours, um, to help customers shop. Because one of the other things that came up was in that bulk department. Lots of non-members or new members don't even understand what the bulk department's about. I think all of us old court members really want to see the bulk department enlarged. But the people who are shopping there now don't even know how to weigh things out, don't know how to use an old scoop compared to a new scoop. You know, I mean, we got a bunch of stuff there with no real good, clear signage people felt 
and how new members and non-member shoppers use the golf department. Um, and that's about it. Um, so I have just a couple things from our table. Um, and if I'm missing something, please feel free to fill in because I took not the best notes. But um, so there was real concern around how the um, village market shoppers feel and the co-op, uh, you know, the former site of the co-op feel. Um, you know, I think that's really important to a lot of people is to try to meet the needs of everyone. And then there was some discussion around managing inventory, how there are systems for doing that. Um, like in a store, if you buy four items, then it automatically tells you, like there's computer systems that can automatically tell you that you need to order that. So there's like more streamlined ordering systems available perhaps. Um, and then a couple other suggestions were to have a donate button on the website and then also to become a member on the website, have that as an option. Um, the parking lot pavement is a concern. Um, it feels like a hazard at points. And then um, there was questions about whether a lot of people are walking to the co-op or not. And it sounded like there are quite a few people who are actually walking to the co-op, which is you know, one of the hopes too. So anything I missed? I'm just in the that I'm just saying it, uh, which is I'm a little disappointed at the uh, uh, cafe quote unquote arrangements where people come in and uh, have some coffee. And, you know, as it was in the old co op, it was very welcoming. There was tables there, and you could sit down and have a conversation with somebody. But the way it is now, it's like you're just looking out the window. And everybody's on their devices, and there's nothing, by the way, it's arranged that encourages connection between the different customers that come in. And is that is there any way of providing for that need? Uh, because I think that made me feel very alienated. You know that I just sit there and I wouldn't have any way to talk to somebody. I just and I may, I wouldn't have a device to get lost in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and how would I will I would not bother. Oh, that's that's good. That's that's good feedback. Yeah, right. I just share that I'm saying a lot of that. It's nice that you have a thing, but it's not conducive to community building in the store. Like we're thinking, like you know, when we go in, every time we go in, we talk to somebody that they will give you tips. You know, so we shop in both stores forever, and we'll we'll tell people from both sides, oh, find that, do this, and then if they want to start a conversation, but then you're standing in the aisle, moving out of people's way, and this big opportunity to educate some of our community members, which we love and want, we all want to share the ideas. But she's right, it, it's not conducive to doing that the way it's set up right now. Yeah, no, that's really that's really helpful. So thank you. And I think we're taking notes of yeah. note of all of this. So yeah. Are you looking at it? Nope. Thanks, y'all. Great job. Um, this feedback is vital. Um, the dinners would be great. I think I only saw one sign up. So if you don't want to have dinner with us, just pretend you do and sign up for the sake of your co-op. And, um, there's also a product suggestion list available at the customer service desk at the, at the co-op. And there's also a suggestion box at large for ideas at the co-op. Um, and in terms of this space in the cafe issue, I just love that it came up and I'm just personally going to add my personal note because I have a personal memory of when we were designing the space and it was like the cafe was something to fit in amongst a whole bunch of other priorities described by Chris at length. And I was like, 
Oh, good. So there is room for the cafe. And what's it going to look like? Oh, there's a bar there. And then there's these seats. OK, good. And I remember very quickly brushing past the cafe design, just personally, and um, being glad that there was a solution. But now that it's being mentioned, I really didn't give myself the time and the real authenticity in the critical thinking about that. And I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that criticism is really vital. And when we think about the um, vestibule out front, which expands the retail space, I think um, just considering that, um, in addition to the outdoor space that we want to create for togetherness, is incredibly important feedback, just on a personal level. I'll say that. Um, so we are reaching the end of our meeting. There's a raffle. There's raffle prizes. And if you didn't get a chance to fill out a thing, I think you can. Real last minute now, right now, Catherine's standing up. Go fill out a thing to get a prize. You deserve it. You came. And um, we, the board, um, are woefully underprepared to honor our amazing president who is moving beyond and moving on. Um, we have nothing for you, Annie, except our love. Um, but um, we love you. And thank you. It was really fun to serve with you. And for the last time, your president, Annie Gilliard. Well, they, they say it's the last time because you're only around to run three consecutive terms and then you have to, you're termed out and to, unless you want to join again in another, you know, two years. So you, you might not have seen the last of me, but I have to say... <laughs> It, it has been, uh, it is, I'm looking forward to not being the grocery buyer and the board president. Um, it, it's been a little bit overwhelming since um, having to do both the jobs. <laughs> um, and I, I do at some point want to retire from working at the store. So <laughs> you may still see me as on the board at some point. Um, and it has been an incredible honor um, to have worked at this store for uh, going on my almost 38th year. <laughs> um, and uh, I still love it. I still love going to work. And I still love seeing all your smiling faces at um, this far into a long meeting. <laughs> and um, I, again, I, when, I, when, when we closed the store uh, on the day that we passed papers, which was March 15th, and we met with the village market staff and the um, co-op staff all together under one roof for the first time and introduced ourselves and um, got to know each other. And my role was to say, what is, what, 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 who are we? And I started out by saying, look, we just got this email and picture from Bruce signing papers with the TRAGS and now we own this building, and now we own it. And this is what it is. It's a co-op that we own. And unlike, the, the thing that's amazing about that to me is that that's our home. We don't have to move anymore, hopefully. It doesn't matter if some of us retire. That's our home. That is the co-op space, we own it. And it's a big enough space that we can really increase our vision of what we want to do and what we want to be for this community, for our whole community. And that's important. And the other thing that's amazing is that this money that we make in this running a grocery store is staying in our community. And talking to our local vendors, how much more stuff that they're selling now in our new store we're supporting our local farmers, we're supporting our lo local manufacturers, we're supporting our local, you know, herbalists. We're, it's, it's really heartwarming to really being supporting our own community at the same time as our own community is supporting us. And thank you. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So um, I love being a part of a co-op, especially this one. So thank you all for coming to a, yet another annual meeting. And I'll let you all go home and enjoy your evening. <laughs>